So I'll go ahead and introduce myself. So, um, well, first of all, thank you for coming to our October 2023 teacher Zoom chat. I'm Rebecca Trevelis and I'm in Austin, Texas, and I've been teaching for about 34 years and I own and run um, Austin Arts Academy here in town. So Amanda, you want to chime okay. in? <laughs> and I'm Amanda. Y'all hear a lot from me because I run the newsletter for Music Game Club. I also write the blog. I also help design the games. I, I do a lot of stuff with the games. It's a lot of fun. Um, I have also been teaching for about 16 years and I live in Middle Tennessee. I've lived here for a, about a year and a half now and I've like absolutely love it. I'm come, I'm a Louisiana girl, so I'm not used to the mountains and the cool air and the low humidity. So I'm loving what I have here. I know some people are still like, oh, Tennessee is like still very humid. I'm like, no, you, you don't understand. You drink the air in Louisiana. <laughs> so yes. Um, so that's a little bit about me. Awesome. So um, we can do just a quick round, whoever would like to share. So we have um, a favorite sport, a favorite beverage, or a favorite vacation place. Or you can do all three, or you can just not do any of them. So if if I go first, my favorite hot beverage is roasted dandelion tea. Mm. Yeah, so it might sound a little um, interesting, but it for whatever reason, my body just really loves roasted dandelion tea. So that's my favorite beverage. My favorite sport is, I would say, mountain biking, just because it's very challenging and it gets you out in nature, which are two of my favorite things that I love. Um, and then my favorite vacation place, I would say, would be Costa Rica or anywhere I could go surfing. But Costa Rica would be my favorite. What about you, Amanda? Yeah, I'll go next. So my favorite sport is volleyball. Um, our family used to have a volleyball court set up in the front of our yard and we would just go out there and play it. I mean, I've, I've got a lot of siblings, so we had plenty enough to make up two teams most of the time. So um, that would probably be my favorite sport. Um, my favorite beverage is probably hot chocolate, though I do really like a lot of different hot teas. I'm going to have to try the roasted dandelion. Like, that's been on my list to try dandelion, but it's like, ooh, I wonder what it tastes like. I wonder what it tastes like, period. And then I wonder what it tastes like roasted. So I'll have to try that. Um, and then favorite vacation place. Honestly, I just, I enjoy traveling. I enjoy traveling where there's fewer people. It's like, I like taking pictures. So I like nature stuff. I, I prefer nature or even historic sites over like your big touristy towns and stuff like that. So I don't really have a general, a uh, specific location, just a general location. Nature with water, mountains, trees, that type of thing. Awesome. Anybody else want to share a favorite drink or favorite vacation spot, favorite sport? Um, I live in South Dakota and being from the northern part of the United States, I like to drink iced tea, but not with sugar in it. Okay. And my favorite vacation spot is right here in South Dakota in the Black Hills. Nice. That's great. I'm seeing that Julie wrote in the chat that her favorite hot beverage right now is organic English breakfast tea with honey and lemon. And her favorite <laughs> sport is yoga. And her favorite vacation spot is anywhere she's going. So that's great. Julie is recovering from bron bronchitis, so she's resting her voice right now. So she won't, she won't be, she'll be chatting instead of talking. <laughs> she'll be chatting in the chat instead of talking with her mouth. <laughs> I'm Trudy Norman and I live in the state of Georgia and have been in the South all my life. I've lived in the South all my life. My favorite vacation spot my husband and I have been to is Mackinac Island, Michigan. Mm -hmm. And um, it's an island that I love Victorian era just about everything. And it has all these old homes there. Um, we got to stay in a bed and breakfast and we stay there for a little bit, uh, almost a week, maybe five days, something like that. And they don't allow vehicles on the island. So it's all horse and buggy and uh, bicycles. And it was just, it was beautiful and calm and peaceful vacation. And we loved it. Wow, that's a different change of pace. What a, yeah, that I can imagine how peaceful that yes. was. Much slower. <laughs> Wonderful. Well, thank yes. you for sharing. Yes. 
that's that's great. It's so nice to kind of get to know y'all a little bit behind the scenes here. Um, so I would like to mention that at 1050, we are doing a giveaway of our current monthly game, which is called Scarecrow Scores. So stick around for that at the end. At 1050, we will draw a name and one of y'all will receive that game. Um, our topic for discussion today is common student confusions. So I have a few things and Amanda has a few things, but there might be some things that y'all currently see in your studio or with your students that is a common thread or, or maybe just with one student, this is very confusing for them. So we'd like to talk about all these topics and kind of brainstorm and give our solutions and suggestions, things that have worked for us. Um, so yeah, so my first one is uh, older students who have transferred to me and they have collapsing knuckles. So they are pressing that key and it is just, it it's so cringy for me. And I work with them. So I'm I'm open to suggestions if y'all if y'all have conquered this in older students, because I'm constantly reminding them in the lesson and I'm working with them like on a solid surface. They can do it if I demonstrate it and they see it and they can do it, but then they play and maybe the first few notes they remember and then it's collapsing again. So I struggle with this. Um, so I don't know if y'all have ever experienced that with older students and I'm saying older meaning like they're eight to 14 years old. So they've been taking for a while but they transferred into me and they've even been with me. Some of them have been with me already for a couple of years and it's, I'm not making headway. So I'm, I'm, I'm struggling here. I'm a little concerned for their um, fingers. Any ideas? Maybe I'm just not being, you know, aggressive enough with spending more time in the lesson. I know one thing that I see, I think Abigail Prophet did it, was um, getting the poppets and having them push it down. Because then they're not worried about, like, if they're playing on the piano, they're worried about hitting the right note and all that. But, like, they're it still gives them that resistance mm -hmm. of pushing something down without their finger buckling. So I know that's one thing that she uses. I don't know if she uses it on older students. I know she uses it on younger students, but that's something I mean. Okay. Anybody else? What do y'all do for the younger ones when you, when you start teaching them? Are there certain things that you always do or do you just handle it on a case by case basis? Just curious. Um, Julie is popping in the chat here that arena has some videos about that float like a butterfly. Yeah. So, um, Catherine Fisher, um, she's the piano safari, uh, one of the piano safari ladies. She's so that works so well with younger children, like even Zechariah Z, but like that very percussive, like practicing, um, is very good and just landing like pushing it into the putty, pulling it up and then pushing it down on the key and making sure that it's nice and strong. And that that works so well when they're when we first have our students, like when they're first starting out and we can capture that great hand position. I will say that these students do have a nice hand position, like they're not super flat or collapsing down on, you know. So they do have a nice position, but as soon as they play that key, it is just, ugh. <laughs> One of the things uh, Melody Payne was showing uh, the video of doing the the. Can you see with the? Oh, that's a good one. Yes. Yeah, I've done that with a couple. I only taught one week, and then I got this bronchitis, and but I tried this with a couple students, and it worked pretty well. So okay, I yeah, I like that idea because an older student wouldn't be turned off by that. <laughs> right. I will say something else to consider is uh hyper joint mobility issues like some students they just they truly have a joint mobility issue and it's not actually something so that would just be something to consider you know are they like double jointed can they do their elbow in a weird way if that's the case then they may not that actually might be something to discuss with the parents actually therapy not something that a piano teacher can do that's something i just thought of because i have a friend who has joint mobility that is a good point there's there's two of the, these students that I'm 
thinking of, and I'm, I am suspecting that it, that there are some other things. Um, yeah. In which case I'm like, Hey, talk to the parents just because I know a friend and she's in her mid twenties now that she's dealing with. And she's like, if I would have known when I was a teen that I had these issues, yeah. she could have worked on building out her collagen and all that sort of stuff. So that's there's one of, one of my students too. She's also plays clarinet in the middle school band and her third finger, it's like, it locks, like she wants to curl it way back. And I've never seen a student do that before. Like, I don't know what it is. And mm. it's kind of a new thing that's popped up. Um, anyway, I'm just going to watch it. So that may come up. I may ask y'all for help if y'all, y'all have any solutions for that, but I've noticed it lately as her repertoire is getting harder. So I don't know if it's tension or if it's like a clarinet, like, I don't know what it is. Um, something that could help is like, instead of saying, oh, stop being tense is like one thing that really helps me with tension. Cause I didn't think I was being tense. I didn't feel like I was being tense. So if you ask her, are you, is your hand tense? She'll probably say no just because I, I was that student. Um, but my teacher had me, um, oh, what's that? I can't remember. Piano. There's a really good piano series on YouTube. Like they, they have all these technique videos. I cannot think of what it is. It might be, I'm gonna have to, I'll have to send you a link later. Okay. But my teacher was like, never hit the piano key in the same place. So like constantly, like you could be like stroking the keys as you're playing the hard passages, you're going up and down on the keys, forward and backward. And that eliminated the tension. Like he didn't say stop being tense. He just said, do, do like this and focus on this. And for some reason, changing that motion helps me to not be intense. So there, there could be around the world type of solution for that if it's tension. And this girl is growing so, so fast right now. Like she's just like, I think she's grown several inches this year. So I think probably her body is trying mm. to manage <laughs> that big change. Um, and so her joints and probably her muscles are, are still like adapting to like a bigger structure. Um, so yeah, I'm going to keep an eye on that, but. Okay. So let's see. I had another, um, okay. So navigating scores. So this kind of ties into, to this month's game, because this is a common, um, confusion when students get into, and I say more advanced repertoire, it's really like late beginner, early intermediate repertoire. They're going to start seeing a first and second ending. So that's the first confusing thing that they're going to come across. Then eventually they're going to get maybe into a da capo or a del Senio. So um, I have, yeah, a few students right now. And so I was su super excited that we developed this game this month because it's like, okay, we are playing this game and it's going to reinforce and we're going to move it around. So it's not like they can memorize where it is. They always have to be paying attention and looking for it. So um, I, I guess my question for y'all is, I don't, I'm a very like, I don't mark scores. I don't write in scores only if it's like, really dire like you are constantly missing this okay I'm finally going to make like a little mark I don't know why I, I guess maybe it's because I've seen teachers just <laughs> completely cover scores with writing and that's I don't know I guess growing up seeing that I wanted to be the opposite of that <laughs> I'm not saying that I'm better because <laughs> I'm probably that's probably just a reaction um, but I'm wondering if there's there's kind of there's ways that y'all found with sticky tabs or, or clear, like some washi tape or highlighters, or if there's a way that y'all have found that helps students remember faster when they're looking at a score. Because I just kind of verbally remind them, hey, you already played the first ending. You shouldn't be playing that right now. <laughs> like jump to the second ending. Okay, Julie is saying that she's, used removable highlighter tape, not washi tape. Okay, I have never used removable highlighter tape, but I like that idea. I haven't either, but I've seen on one of my Facebook pages for teachers, piano teachers, that that's like a very favorite item. I need to get into this highlighter tape stuff. It <laughs> sounds really cool. I I like the um, erasable highlighters that really? are 
are out now. Yes, they're erasable highlighters and um, I can get, you can get them at Staples and Amazon, I know, and they are fantastic. And so, you know, I can highlight for a couple of lessons there for a couple of weeks, they can have them highlighted. And then if you didn't like all the marks on the page, you could, you know, you can erase it later after they get it. <laughs> oh, that's fabulous. That's great. I, yes. What a great solution. Thank you. Love it. Julie is also saying that the removable highlighter tape works great. It comes in a set of six different colors on Amazon. Um, are those like transparent sticky tabs? Because like for a long time ago, I had like at Walmart, they had, you know how you have your, like your little bitty sticky. Thin, yes. Yeah. But they're transparent. Is that the same thing? I think it all, it sticks all the way. Oh. On sticky tabs is tape. So instead of it flapping up, like the whole thing stays down. Sweet. But yeah, I love those sticky tabs. That's how I mark students' books so they can they can see what page they were supposed to turn mm -hmm. right to. Um, like I would I would use those transparent and put that over the notes because then if a student no longer struggles with it, it's like what Trudy was saying with erasing it, you could take it away. Because I'm the same way. Like I would get books from used books from thrift stores or whatever, and you can't even read the music. I'm like, how depressing is it to be playing this music with all these marks that the teacher did? I mean, I get it. Like for me, if I'm the if I'm the one making the marks go like, oh, I'm just like, I need that reminder there. Yeah. So I like doing it where it's removable. Awesome. Okay. The next topic I um, have is chatty children. So um, children who are just very, very chatty and they just want to tell you everything. And I personally don't experience this just because the, the, um, I think my personality, I just don't allow for that. So nope, we're going to play. Nope. I just like, we're, but I have a few teachers who struggle with this and I have heard lately from the parents, Hey, my child's talking a lot. And so that's kind of affecting the parent. They're like, you know, I'm paying for 30 minutes or 45 minutes of instruction. And my child is literally talking like 50 or 75% of the lesson. And so the parent is feeling like they're not getting the full lesson amount, which I totally understand. Um, so one suggestion recently that a parent emailed me concerning another teacher that works for Austin Arts Academy. She said, you know, at school, the teacher has these five cubes. And every time the student interrupts or has a question or wants to share something, the teacher says, okay, you know, you can do that. And, you know, I'm going to take one of the cubes away. And so he basically has five times he can do that. And then when his cubes are up, he's out for the day. So he's got to manage like when he wants to share what he wants to share. Um, so I shared that with the teacher. I don't know what the teacher decided to do with that, but I'm just curious if y'all have um, what you've done with those chatty children. I like that idea. Um, I have a lot of children that love to talk. And one of the things that I have tried to do that I think is working for me now is, um, is trying to get the talking out of the way at the very beginning. So they first come in and they know where they need to go to wash their hands. And then they come into the studio. And by that time, the student ahead of them is leaving. And, you know, so we're kind of making that transition. And as they're making that transition time from coming home from school or to their, you know, their car or their carpool or whatever it is to getting into my home, that's when I say, well, how was your day today? Or what did you do at school today? Or I'll usually say something along that line, just kind of making that transition into my studio give them a chance to chat for maybe two minutes and we try to just get it out of our system. And then we, then we get to work. And the rest of the time, I don't usually have a, have too much of an issue unless there's a title of a piece or something that they get excited about because it uses the name of their dog in it or something like that. You know, we have to talk about that, but normally, <laughs> normally we can get the chatting out at the very beginning and then we're good for the rest. I like that. Yeah, that's great. That's a good point. I'm, I'm like thinking through this because I just started teaching my five, almost six year old niece and she is very imaginative and very talkative and very over the top everything. And um, that's what her mom's like. She's like, I don't know how much you're going to get done. 
<laughs> anyway, she's like, she also likes making up her own song and you've got to stop her because otherwise, it, that's what she walked in the door this last week. She's like, I made up two pieces and they were very long. <laughs> and her mom's like, yes, they were. Don't let her do that to you. And I'm like, no, I won't. But what I've noticed for her is I think, I wonder if sometimes her chattiness comes with the attention span. Like whenever she's starting to get bored with the concept. So like this week, she started either being chatty or started playing her own little composition, which I, I do like encouraging that. I'd be like, oh, that's fun. And like, you know, try it high, try it low, you know, trying to expand her, you know, vocabulary as she's playing it. But I did notice that I would ask her, I was like, so do you want to, do you want to finish playing your composition? Or I guess it'd be, do you want to finish talking about this? Or do you want to play a game? Like kind of like, by the way, you realize that the more you do this, the less games you play, that type of thing. Um, but yeah, I'm gonna have to, if it gets to be an ongoing issue, cause like I'm figuring out like this week, I'm like, hmm, I wonder if it's, she's getting bored and that's why she's chatty. She's getting bored and that's why she's playing around. And so, um, but I will keep that five cubes in mind because that might come in handy. I think sometimes too, students are insecure or maybe didn't practice. And so they get to talking because they just are hesitant to start playing. <laughs> Or maybe they're a perfectionist and they just don't want to make a mistake. You know, like they're just kind of frozen. So chatting is a way to kind of maybe delay the inevitable mistake in their mind. So, um, yeah, these are great. Thank you. Oh, I, looks I, like I unmuted myself. I hope you all don't mind if I share a story. Yeah. <laughs> but I, so I've got this one student and I've had him. I had him before COVID and then he didn't take during COVID. And he's always been very hyperactive and not focused very well. When he first started, we couldn't hardly get through like one line of music with, you know, a couple measures and that was it. So we progressed, we progressed. We we're getting through whole songs. But last year he was playing Ode to Joy and he got to the last three notes of the song and he turns around, looks at me and he says, my chicken died yesterday. We never did finish the rest of the song. Oh, no. <laughs> but he, you know, he's one of those ones that constantly interrupts and he's always got a story to tell me, but you know, <laughs> so. It's funny how sometimes music can do that. If you just have some quiet space and some music, your brain starts to go different places that are important to you. And that's probably why it just popped in his head. Yeah, he, he just had to, <laughs> three notes. Away. But he, he's he's come a long way, you know, and you just kind of, sometimes with kids, you just have to kind of go with the flow and yeah, he's yeah. into it. But I like the, the cube idea. Mm -hmm. I always like it when students do converse, you know, it is developing that relationship and that bond with them. You know, I I want a little bit of talking at some it's almost harder when they're not talking or not looking you in the eye. You know, that's another like challenge, you know, as teachers, sometimes we have students like that. Um, initially, usually they start to warm up. Um, so another, um, so I have two more things real quick. So group, I don't know if y'all teach any group lessons or group piano or maybe group master classes, but sometimes we get students that just are interrupters. They have bad attitudes. They say things out loud, like, oh, I don't want to do this. Or you can tell by their body language. They're just, they don't want to do cup rhythms. And you're like, what? Everyone loves cup rhythms. Like, why are you, you know? So I don't know if y'all have ever troubleshot, like how to manage that kind of behavior or attitude when you can sense that someone just has a negative attitude or maybe doesn't want to be there. Um, what y'all have done in the past. It's a hard one for me because I tend to just kind of ignore just like we're doing this and, and I tend to laugh and have fun. You know, I want it to be, I want them to see how fun it is. So I just model that for them. Um, but I just, oh man, it gets me down when someone is, is negative or interrupting and just, you know, uh, it's hard, hard behavior. It's normal behavior in children, <laughs> but. I recently subbed for a teacher and this came up and that's what, why I was like, Ooh, yeah. What is this hard? I don't teach group lessons. I do have four piano classes a year, one every season where all my students are together and they play for each other. We usually have a snack and we play a game. 
Um, so we um, we are, are all together four times a year other than recitals, you know, and that kind of thing. Um, and I have had bad attitudes, particularly though with some of the older kids in those classes. And I think maybe some of it is an attitude because I'm in here with these little guys and I think I'm more mature than them and I shouldn't have to be in this class with them kind of thing. And um, one of the things that that has helped is for me to give them a responsibility of some sort. So, um, and because they are older, I could do that. You know, they've probably had more lessons. I've taken lessons longer. And so they can, I can assign them to a child that's having some problems with something or they can help them with that. And so they kind of feel like they're helping the teacher kind of situation. And it gives them a little bit more, um, um, responsibility, but it also makes them feel like, oh, I have a purpose here. She can actually use me or, you know, and doesn't make it quite as, um, I don't know. It just kind of helps their, their attitude a little bit, um, not be quite so negative, but I don't know if that's something that can be used in a group classroom situation, you know, when you've got a lot of keyboards in the room and everybody's playing at one time, I don't know if you can use that or not, but that's what I do. Yeah. I like that suggestion. I think it could, I, in that situation where, where I was dealing with the cup rhythms, I, I could have asked the student, hey, can you just demonstrate the first line for us? Just so he has kind of like, I don't know, a spotlight on him. Um, I don't know, that would have worked, but I'll try that. Yeah, kind of giving them some authority or some leadership role. I like that. Um, the last thing I had was like note direction confusion for students. Um, whether it's going up or down or or skipping or stepping. And I suspect with s some of the kids that are still struggling that they do have a processing um, issue that hasn't been discovered or that has not been relayed to me. Um, so yeah, and one girl has been a great piano player great reader. She can read really well. And then all of a sudden this year, she's really struggling. And I don't know what's, what changed. Like she's, it's like, she's guessing she doesn't know. Um, so I don't know if y'all have come across that and how you handled it. I've been just very patient with her and very calm about it. Like trying not to make a big deal out of it. Um, but it is concerning, like, you know, you should be able to see that that's going down there and you're just, you're going up. <laughs> Or I'll even say, oh, remember it's stepping down, da da da, and she'll she'll go the opposite way, or she'll play the the other hand. It's like, wow, this is this is interesting. This is a new new confusion for the student. How long has she been taking lessons? She's been taking lessons for three years. Okay, and this is something that just kind of came up all of a sudden, like she was doing well with it before. Doing well before what's really interesting wow. to me is I also teach her older sister and her older sister has always had this problem so I was like oh no what you know I yeah mm. it's yeah have you tried any manipulatives like Wendy at music escapades how she has that magnetic board with the dots on it like the magnetic dots no I have not and like you can color code them and do like, hey, we're going to do the lowest yellow, the highest blue and in or something like that. Okay. And, and then like, I'm thinking like taking it out of the piece and like doing like, okay, now we're going to play this on all the octaves, you know, like even though you're playing low, it's still going up. I don't mm -hmm. know. That, that's something that I would try. That's a good suggestion. Yeah. I haven't been having her sight read, so that might be something else that I could have her just outside the music, like, hey, we're just going to do one line as kind of part of your warm up. Mm -hmm. I've not had her do that. Um, so that's that's something that I probably should try as well. If you've not used Piano Adventures, they've got an app um, for their sight reading books. I love using that because it records it and you can hear it. And, okay. and it also, I think, I think it will let them know if they got notes wrong. So then like it might, part of it might just be, she's not paying as close of attention 
and she's guessing my ear students do this all the time I can't say anything I was a terrible ear student myself um but they'll just like guess and they'll just kind of play around it's like are you actually looking at your notes you know so uh something like that might cause her to be like oh you know because it's like I don't like I don't like the program telling me I got something wrong right yeah she does she loves playing games so I think she would like the manipulate manipulatives idea I have used Piano Maestro with her in the past and I could pull that out and just go, you know, very easy um, and see how she does. So that's a good, good suggestion. I didn't know that about Piano Adventure sight reading. I'm writing that down. That sounds good. Yeah, they have, so they have the app and I'm, if I'm not mistaken, I think the student may have to pay like $3 a month, but it's free for the teacher. So I haven't done that this year, but. Whenever I had a bunch of beginners, I did it. I was really good. Yeah. yeah. Awesome. I think, Amanda, you had a couple of confusing topics on your end. Yeah. Uh, before I get into it, though, do you all have any, like, we've been discussing a lot of stuff. Do you all have anything that you're like, oh, this is something that I was thinking of one of my students have issues with? Does anyone have else have a question you'll want to ask first? I have two. But I'm kind of, if somebody else has something, that's fine, too. <laughs> Go for it. Um, one of one of mine is just note naming, just note naming, and I I teach both note naming and intervallic reading, so they're we're doing both. You know, um, they need to know where to start, where their hands go, and all of that at the beginning, and then from there we can you know read intervall inter intervallically. Um, but there's I have some kids that take off with that note reading thing and they do great. And I'm like, wow, let's just keep on moving. And then I've got some kids that are like two years in and I'm pointing to a treble G and they're looking at me like a calf at a new gate. And I have no idea, like, how did you get this far? And you don't, that's triple G yet. Yeah, that was the first note we learned. Don't you remember? You know, so um, there are, I know the piano safari a method. I like the idea of putting both both the grand staff together and you've got the GBD face or the face GBD and you help them see all that and how it works together. Uh, you know, you have the um the sentences to help them remember remember in treble clef and bass clef, but then they can't remember which one is treble clef and which one is bass clef. And so anyway, any ideas for those kids where just the naming of notes and, and figuring out where what to note to play on the piano is a problem. I'll take any advice. <laughs> my my favorite thing to do is I, and you might do this or you might've done this is I have them name the notes while they play. They don't mm -hmm. love doing it, but it's like, we get them to count out loud. Why don't we get them to name notes out loud? Name so notes. I have done that. Uh, I think particularly I had one of my, one of my sisters, she could read notes, but she couldn't tell you the name of them. And I'm like, <laughs> I mean, it's good that you know what note goes to what key on the piano, but I really like that note reading, note playing association. And so mm -hmm. for my students, often like the, their just pat assignment is name notes while you play, count while you play, and then you can just do whatever, you know, maybe work mm -hmm. on different things. I have found that to help a lot. And uh, in addition to um, playing games, I like... Um, Note rush. Um, Note rush. Yeah, I have that. I, I really like that one. Um, but then we have we have two two right note reading games, Starfish Staff and Keyboard Kittens. Um, so those are two games to. It's like basically it's a glorified flashcards thing mm -hmm. because I used to do flashcards with my students all the time. It's like how much more fun is it to play a game and they don't feel like oh I'm drilling flashcards. Right. So, sure. <laughs> Yeah, so that would be another alternative is to get it away from the piano. But I would honestly even play these games with the piano. Like if you did it, you can do it multiple ways. Like play the game, just play the game, have them name the notes, even have a chart in front of them if they need it. Just basically getting them. It's like memorizing mathematics versus using a mathematic table, um, like times table or whatever. Uh, mama has done both. I was homeschooled. So mom did both with some of her kids and we all learned our general multiplication table about the same way, whether or not we looked at it every time or spent hours memorizing it. Because it's like, if you keep on looking at it, you will learn what it is. So you could even play the game with a chart in front of you and they just match it and say what it is. And then you could bring mm -hmm. it to the keyboard and be like, all right, we're going to name, you know, what is this? Find it in position on the piano 
and then you move forward on the game. So you can use the game to your advantage in that way too. Yes. Okay. Thank you. So I'll, I'll jump in here really quick. So I used to teach using acronyms to all of my students. And um, then I started teaching them intervallically. And then I learned about landmark notes. So I was kind of mm-hmm. doing all, all of the things. And then I watched, um, this was a few years ago, um, Samantha Coates. She's an Australian composer. She writes mm-hmm. the Blitz books. So Blitz. she did a talk. Yes. Yeah, so she did a talk. She was at a teacher convention. They recorded this um, talk that she gave. And this was full of music teachers. And she said, okay, we're, I'm going to teach you how to how to find notes, how to name notes on the staff. So it was like every Joey, like she had, you know, something completely different than what we're used to. It was a brand new acronym. So she taught Mm -hmm. it to the teachers and then she had the notes on the staff and she was like, okay, we're going to go really quick. We're going to quiz you. Okay. What is this note? And it took the teacher for teacher. Every single teacher struggled with it. So that was Uh very eye opening for me. And then she went back to, okay, landmark note, like this is Joey. You know, so she had like maybe the treble clef G line. She was like, this uh-huh. is Joey. Okay, what is this note? And everyone could figure it out very quickly. So it was very eye-opening to me that, yes, they do, they forget, they flip-flop from treble clef to bass clef. And I realized, okay, I need to stop using the acronyms. Right. Um, I do have a few students, like for whatever reason, my brain, I learned the acronyms never got, like it worked. And I have a few students that it, it does work for them, yeah. but. Um, other students, yeah, it's like they just need more repetition. They just need more practice and more more gamification, I think. Yeah, maybe that's it. I just need to spend a lot more time on it, too. And I haven't had them naming the notes out loud probably as often as I should. We do it sometimes, but not consistently. So yeah. when I play note speed, that's another game. When I play note speed, I require that the student actually say the note when they play a card because uh-huh. I think they're doing kind of what they're when they're playing music they can see that it goes up or down but they don't know the note name they're just right. kind of like guessing ish sure. you know mm-hmm. So, yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah oh boom cards is something I'm trying to do more of too yeah yes. Julie, um, Julie had said that she's invested a lot in boom cards which I will say uh, Melody Payne like go to melodypain.com they pretty much have the market on boom cards between Melody and Kelly um, yes. They, yes. They have really good boom cards too. I do and have, the- I do have some boom cards too. That's a good idea. I needed to use those more often for note naming. Yeah. And Susan Paradis, Par- Paradis, Par- Par- how do you, pr- how does she pronounce her name? I'm, it- I'm not sure how she, I would say Paradis, Paradise. Paradis. Par- par- paradise. Whatever. <laughs> <laughs> I know. Okay. Um, yeah, Julie mentioned that Susan has a great grand staff PDF that has blank notes and she has the students color all the lines, one color and the spaces another, and then write the notes in. We put those on the front cover of their binders. Yeah, that's a good oh. reference. Yes. Reference activity for them. That's good. That's good. I mean, other question was any advice on students that, um, they come back to their, they've, they've just been introduced to a piece or some of a piece, partial partial pieces of a piece maybe. And they come back the next week and they've got it memorized. And um, I love the fact that it's easy for some students to memorize. I think that's a gift and that's fantastic. But very often, you know, there's something that's incorrect. There's something they've memorized wrong. <laughs> And so they've been playing it that way all week long and they've loved it and they're excited to show me what they can do. And they're not even look, they may put the music in front of them, but they are not looking at it. They are looking at their hands the whole time and they're playing things incorrectly. So um, anyone else have that issue and how do we, how do we help them actually, I have a teenage boy right now I'm thinking of that is, is 15 And he's only been taking eight months and he is taking off. He loves it. And it's so exciting to me to have a teenage boy like this who is enjoying this so much. But that's what's happening is he is not looking at the music and reading it in his, in his less, you know, when he comes back to play for me, he is reading it when we're first learning the piece and we're sight reading it together at his lesson. But when he comes back after he's prepared for the week, he's not reading anymore help that that sounds like an ear player to me 
it is. Yes, he is. Yes. Yeah, I feel you on this. I have a few students that are like this and it's it's hard not to, you know, it would be easy for me to come in and squash their, you know, like, hey, mark all the things right. that are wrong, you know, so it, it is, it is challenging. Um, sometimes the first thing I'll do is I'll just pick maybe one or two spots. I won't pick all of them and I'll pick one or two spots and I'll play it the way he's played it. And then I'll play it the correct way. And I'll have him look at the score and say, which way is, is, is the score written? Mm -hmm. Um, and so hopefully he can hear sometimes they can't, they just hear the way they've played it and they think that's the correct way. And then, I, and then we clap and count the rhythm. Usually it's a rhythm thing. Sometimes it's a note thing. Um, mm -hmm. Usually if it's a note thing, they can hear, oh yeah, that, that is a different note. If it's a note and a rhythm thing, sometimes it's both. <laughs> mm -hmm. And it's just, you know, a little more complicated to, to fix, but yeah, I usually just try to pick one or two spots and then, you know, do it again the next week, one or two more spots. But yeah, I have, I have a couple of students that are exactly like this and I know every week they're going to come back and it's going to be memorized and there's going to be some, some spots that are yes. wrong. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Uh, and I'll tell them, I said, now Zach, you're, you know how to read the music, you know, when it's going up and which direction to go and, and when it's going down and he knows um, intervals up from like seconds to fifths right now. And so I um, said, so you can look at the music and not even have to look at your hands. You really can do this, you, can look, you know, and he would, if he would do that, he would probably be playing it correctly, but he wants, he doesn't want to <laughs> look at his hands. But Enough, um, yeah, I like that. Maybe not correcting everything at once. Mm -hmm. If you give him sight reading with a track, um, even if it's like Piano Adventures lesson books or whatever, have you can get a 499 track or whatever. They don't even have to buy the book. If they have a tablet, they can just buy the app. Even if it's like, mm -hmm. I would say it's a lesson book that he doesn't take. There's other places. Um, Rebecca knows tons of people that do track stuff, but that would be something that might keep them better on target. Cause then he's reading it and he's like, oh wait, what I'm playing is not the same as what they're playing. So it might be a fun way for him to be corrected gently. Yes. Thank yeah, you. He does, he does have a good ear. Yeah. I, a lot of times it's kind of like a catch 22 with those good ear students. They'll listen to something they could c catch their mistakes, but then also they could just learn it much faster without even reading the music. So right. it's, it's a tricky <laughs> thing, you know, like having a recording yes. of your hands playing it correctly or them listening to a recording. Like there is that kind of like, Oh, you, you want them to get it correct, but yeah. Also learn how to self-correct and, and find mistakes with rhythm. Yes. 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 Well, good questions. All right, we're almost out of time, so I better get to Scarecrow scores before I run up because this answers, I feel, a lot of questions. Right, you have to give me a second to figure out how to get my camera swapped over. Okay. So, yeah, you're going to see, like, all my tripods and stuff. So, how many of you have watched our video on scarecrow scores already or is this the first time you've really seen much of it okay so i'm going to walk through the entire game so first off what you have is um it is in the basic sense it's just a score there's there's four systems you have is that 12 measures sorry i'm not feeling like doing math really quick and so you can actually play this with very beginning students to help them learn to go across from the beginning to end. So you can play as is. And of course it's not included, but you do need a die. So the basic general gameplay is to roll your die and you have your different crow game pieces, which are absolutely adorable. There are eight of them. Um, so you roll the die and then you move forward a measure per roll like this one was a one so then if you roll again that's six you'd move forward one two three four five six whoever reaches the final bar line first wins all right that's the basic gameplay i would play that with my very beginning students who maybe just for fun just for fun and then we have level one cards and level two cards but the level one cards they have a repeat sign they have several eight va this one is 8VA and 8VA, so for an octave above and an octave below for the different hands. There's a fermata. There's a repeat both hands 8VA. 
Then there's an 8VB. We have two, two cards. We've got 8VB and 8VA under the staff because different books use different ones. I would actually want my students mm -hmm. to recognize both of them, to know that, hey, if it's underneath, whether it says 8VB or 8VA, it means go an octave below. Then there's 15MA. There's repeat 8VA under the staff. 15MB, 8VA under the staff. Repeat both hands, 8VB. There is one measure repeat three times. Then there's a repeat 8VB underneath, the 15MA underneath, repeat 8VA. There's a bunch of 8VAs and 8VBs. Repeat both hands, 8VA. Then here's the alternative to what we saw earlier where it's 8VA and 8VB instead of both 8VA. And then a forward repeat sign. So what you do, unlike most games, you don't randomize these cards. You actually pick which card. So I'm going to choose this one where it's like the repeat three times, and I'm going to overlay it right here. And then I will use the fermata, and I will put mm. the fermata right here. Anyone and else struggle with kids blasting through fermatas? Why is it <laughs> so hard for them That's to right. stop? <laughs> like, stop and hold. <laughs> We'll finish out with AVB right here. All right, yeah. So this, when a student's playing this, then they have to go through, and let's say they roll to six. They'll do one, two, three. This is repeat three times. Four, five, six. So then they have to know that they get stuck on that one for three times. And then whenever they get to the fermata, the fermata is, I think, two, two turns. So, like, if you roll a four and you're right here, you'll do one, two, three, four. And then whenever they reach the eight VB, there's two ways you can do this. You can either just have them say, oh, that means play an octave below and they just have to identify it. Or there's for fun, you could put your game piece under the staff and say, oh, that means you got to go down there and then finish out like that. So that's kind of like the gist of all of these cards is like, they're very easy to, you can put them wherever. You can just start with one thing. So Let's say you wanted to teach your student repeat. So you would get, I have to find it. You get the repeat sign and you would stick that at the end instead of the regular. And then you would just play the game, but then they have to go through the game board twice. So it's a really progressive game. You could do it wherever your student is, if they're learning ADA or anything, and you can just add things one at a time. So those are the level one cards. The level two cards are the really fun ones. Um, there's first, second, and third endings. This is the second ending. They're not going to be in order on here. Um, there's repeat 15 MA. There's DC Alcoda. There is repeat both hands 15 MA. Then there's two octaves above and below staff. There's the Segno. There's the third ending. Repeat 15 MA. DS Alphine. Sorry, I'm pulling out some of these that I want to like put on the game board and show how they work. Repeat both hands and two octaves below. There's the first ending. There's the two coda. DC Alpha Ne. Uh, another repeat two octaves below. DS Alcoda. Repeat both hands, 15 and B, and then there's the finet. Now, a lot of these you have to use together and you have to know what they mean to do them. And that's, I'm actually going to work on getting a video out in the next two weeks to basically walk through. Here's exactly what has to go with what. So the, the endings, let's well, say you just want to work on your ending. So there's a first ending, a second ending, and a third ending. And so let's say you have your first ending here, then your second ending, then your third ending. So whenever the student plays this, they play it, then at the first ending, they go here. Then they play it, then they have to skip the first ending to the second ending. And then they play it, and then they go to the third ending and play to the end. So they like it's very easy because they don't have to read notes. All they have to do is roll the die and move their game piece forward, but it's teaching them exactly what they need to know. And then one of my favorites is we've got the coda. So this is the full, like a really, really oblong card. It's not a normal card, but you would obviously put that at the end. And then um, we'll have the Capo Alcoda. And so um, I guess that would be right here, wouldn't it? Okay, I will admit, codas are the one things that I'm like, I know how to read them, but I'm second guessing whenever I have to put them down. I'm like, am I doing this right? 
All right. So then, yeah, that would be correct. So you'd have the Takapo Alcoda. So you go back to the beginning. And then right here, you have the two coda. And then they would have to go to the coda and finish it out. So it's also, great, it's also great to have students place it kind of like you were just like, wait, I, you're second guessing yourself, have them make up the score. Order. Yeah. And then you can check their work. You know, it's it's fun for kids to change it up every week and make a new score that has all these, you know, special events that you've got to be paying attention to. And also knowing that, hey, if you have one thing like, OK, if you have DCL finet, you also need the finet. Like, like these cards have to go together. So that's another thing. So that is our October game. I'm like super excited about this one um, because I feel like it's very practical and just it will be a very easy way for students to have fun while they learn. Like it's complicated whenever they're learning them in lesson books and you can teach it to them a lot faster this way um, than if you're just waiting for like lesson piece number 15 and 20, you know. So um, I'm really excited about this one. And we want to give one of you this game. So um, if y'all want to have an extra entry, I'll get an entry automatically just by being here. But if y'all want an extra entry, if y'all would share, finish the sentence, I like music game club because, and finish the sentence. And it could be anything, even if you've not been like a member and have played our games. Um, it could be like what you like about the chats, what you like about our blog posts, what anything that music game club has to offer. Um, so if you want an extra entry, you can either put it in the chat or you can unmute yourself and talk it out. I like Music Game Club because I have enjoyed this chat today and I've learned some things that I'm going to put into practice. Thank you, Trudy. So Julie says, I like Music Game Club because they look fun and focus on one specific concept. And Marla says, I like it because games are fun. Yeah, I'm I'm such a big fan of games. Like uh even my older students love it. We you know, we specifically make our games so they are not babyish in any way. You know, we hire artists to draw crows and um salamanders, and, you know, it's a sometimes harder music theory concept and so we can teach the younger kids but we can also teach the older kids who are really deep into it in the music. So mm -hmm. uh, Yeah, Julie's saying I really need to get the games printed and organized yeah that's always on my list every month like it's it, it's it's a thing one of the things that I've learned to do is literally just do the month if if I have if I have several months backlog I just focus on on that month and then eventually I do get to prior months so if that helps at all um yeah you could just I'm just going to do October October's game scarecrow scores and print it and play it with my students this month and not worry about the backlog. And then a lot of times in December, that's when I start to get caught up because I have two or three weeks down from teaching. And so then I can re reprint the games that I missed or that I know that I need to focus on for the spring. Um, so that's just one suggestion. But yes, I feel you. I am I feel like I'm always behind. <laughs> I need to write a blog post about that. I think I have <laughs> one drafted. All right, let's choose a winner so i've got this nice free spinner thingy and scarecrow scores goes to julie i think let's make sure <laughs> yes <laughs> all right i will send you a copy i am so excited for you and your students oh i think you're muted julie and if you happen to already have the game you can gift it to another teacher oh how do I choose? There's two people. <laughs> yeah, it, can, it can be someone on the call. It can be a friend in town, like someone that lives close to you, or that's part of your teacher. Um, if you're yeah. part of like, MTNA, or okay, okay, I've got a friend. I'll send it to. Okay, okay, yeah, just shoot me an email, um, okay. Amanda at Music Game Club, and um, yeah, I'll get her the information. Okay, our. Yeah, I was wondering how that would work if I've already got the game club. Yeah, yeah, share yeah. It with her teacher. So I'll, I'll share it with a friend of mine. Yeah. Okay. okay. Awesome. Thank you. Okay. Right. Well, thank you. Thank you again for coming. Thanks for sharing your thoughts and ideas and suggestions and your student confusion challenges. 
So we appreciate you. If you have any ideas for future topics for our talks, or if you have ideas for a music theory game that you would like for us to develop and release, we are all ears. So please feel free to share with us via email or um, yeah, that email is the best way. So thank you. Thank you all again for coming and hopefully we'll see you next month.